Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. I now present to you the Chancellor of Monash University, Dr. Alan Finkel, who will open this graduation ceremony. Mr. President, Professor Edward Stern, Deputy Chancellor, Dr. Leanne Rowe, Deputy Chancellor, Mr. Ian Holmes, Mr. Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Adam Shoemaker, Dean of the Faculty of Business and Economics, Professor Colin Carney, Dean of the Faculty of Law, Professor Brian Horrigan, Dean of the Faculty of Science, Professor Scott O'Neill, Mr. Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Slotko Shrippus, Professor of Medicine, Paul Komisarov, distinguished vis visitors, members of faculties. It is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Council of Monash University to this, the 907th graduation ceremony of the university, which is being performed on country for which the Kulin nations have been the traditional owners and custodians for many centuries. The university acknowledges their cultures and we pay our respects to their elders, past and present. Ladies and gentlemen, the honorary doctorate is the highest honour that our university can confer. It is awarded by the university in recognition of extraordinary contributions to society. And it is our privilege to be able to confer this honour today on Dor Aung San Suu Kyi, one of the most remarkable political leaders and proponents of democracy in recent generations. I know that the students and staff of Monash University will treasure their memories of this day. I now invite the Vice Chancellor and President, Professor Edward Byrne, to present a candidate for the degree of Doctor of Laws, Honoris Causa. Mr. Chancellor, Doran San Suu Kyi graduated from Lady Sri Ram College in New Delhi, India with a degree in politics. She continued her education at St. Hugh's College at the University of Oxford, obtaining the degree of Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy, Politics and Economics. After graduation, she worked at the United Nations in New York for three years. In 1971, she married Dr. Michael Harris, a scholar in Tibetan literature, who became a research fellow at several colleges at the University of Oxford and a visiting professor at Harvard University before returning to St. Anthony's College at Oxford as a senior research fellow at the position he held at his death in 1999. Between 1985 and 1987, she studied at the University of London and at Kyoto University in Japan and at the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies at Simla, India. In 1988, she returned to Burma to care for her mother. Following the resignation of the military dictator, General Nguyen Win, in July, and the violent suppression of popular demonstrations supporting democracy, she wrote an open letter to the government calling for an independent committee to prepare for democratic elections. A new military junta seized power, and in September, she became the General Secretary of the newly formed National League for Democracy, and she began to tour the country to promote the cause of democracy and freedom. In 1989, she was prohibited by the junta from standing for election, and then placed under house arrest without either charge or trial. In 1991, she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Her sons, Alexander and Kim, accepted the prize on her behalf because she had rejected the offer of the junta to be freed if she would leave Burma and withdraw from politics. Characteristically, she used the prize money to establish a health and education trust for the Burmese people. 
In 1995, she was released from house arrest when she and her husband met for the last time. However, her movements were restricted and members of the League continued to be physically attacked and imprisoned. In 2002, the Junta announced that she was free to move, but in 2003, during a tour of the country, her entourage was attacked and many of her supporters were killed or wounded. She escaped physical harm, but she was arrested and imprisoned and returned to house arrest. In response to international pressure in 2009, she was allowed varying degrees of freedom and she was able to meet visiting heads of state and in November 2010, after a widely <coughs> criticised general election, the Junta released her. The National League for Democracy then announced its intention to register again as a political party. In April 2012, she was elected to Parliament, becoming the leader of the opposition in the lower house. In all those long years of isolation and oppression, she exercised courage and grace in the face of tyranny, inspiring her people through one of the darkest periods of their history with the strength and resolution of body, mind and spirit achieved at an unimaginable personal cost. Again and again around the world, and here today, she is rightly honoured as an extraordinary example of civil courage, offered sacrificially in support of those who are striving everywhere by peaceful means to obtain democracy, human rights and reconciliation. Mr Chancellor, it gives me the greatest pleasure to present to you, for admission to the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa of Monash University, Doran San Suchi. chosen to speak about today is reconciliation and the rule of law. 
I chose reconciliation because I understand that this is a theme particularly dear to this university. And I was very struck by the way in which reconciliation is approached in this university. I have here a quotation. We accept that communication is inherently imperfect, unpredictable, ambiguous, and fragile, and that as a result, reconciliation can never be fully realized as a final state or outcome. Rather, it is an ongoing process that can serve many different purposes. It can continue, it can contribute to consolidating peace, breaking a cycle of violence, restoring justice at the personal and social levels, bringing about personal healing and reparation for past injustices, or building non-violent relationships between individuals and communities. Reconciliation is greatly needed in our country. I'm speaking about reconciliation and the rule of law, not just because I chair the Committee for Rule of Law in the Legislature, but I believe that rule of law is essential to genuine national reconciliation and vice versa. National reconciliation is essential if we are truly to enjoy the fruits of rule of law. Burma is a country of many peoples, as I keep repeating. We are a nation of officially more than 100 ethnic nationalities, but we have not been united. Since we became independent in 1948, we have been fractured by strife, by disagreement, by lack of understanding of one another's aspirations and fears. Because of that, efforts to build a nation have often been hindered. To this day, we have not known absolute peace. Since independence, there have been outbreaks of insurgencies all over the country. Insurgencies because of different ideological beliefs, insurgencies because of different races, ethnic races. Today, there is an effort to bring about a permanent peaceful settlement, but we have still a long way to go. Without genuine reconciliation, we will not be able to achieve what we set out to achieve in 1948 when we thought that we would be the most success successful and vigorous nation in Southeast Asia. We were recognized as the nation most likely to succeed, but all these hopes were dashed by years of military authoritarianism. I'm not now going to speak about the past, but about the future. Why we think that national reconciliation and rule of law are necessary that we may be able to recover, we'll be able to recover from the wounds inflicted on us through years of dictatorship. Through years during which our people never felt the security of the protection of the law. For the great majority of people in Burma, the law is there to oppress them, to suppress them, to restrict them, to stop them from exercising their initiative and from realizing their potential. We now have to work to make them understand that the law is there for them to protect us, to keep us in harmony, to keep us secure, to keep us free, to keep us peaceful, and to help us to prosper. We have to understand one another as we walk the road towards democracy. All too often in the last months, I have had to emphasize the fact that we are just starting out on the road to democracy and we are nowhere near where we wish to get to as yet. We can of course never come to the end of the road. It has to be an ongoing process, like the process of reconciliation. But we want to get to a point when we can say that we are able to leave a safe and precious legacy to generations that will follow us and that they will continue to build the nation that our fathers dreamt of when they fought for independence.
before 1948. There is much violence in the world today. There is violence in my country too. I think most of you know about it. Ethnic strife, communal strife. What is at the base of this strife? It's an inability to reconcile our differences. Allow me to put it that simply. There are, of course, many, many approaches to the problems of my country. But the disability to several differences peacefully has been the main reason for strife within my nation. We have to understand that if we want to build a secure and free country, we have to respect the security and freedom of others as much as we respect our own freedom and our own security. What will get us freedom and security? Rule of law will be a great factor. Rule of law means that we are all equal under the existing laws. I'm a little wary of using the term law by itself because you can be ruled by law rather than having enjoying the fruits of rule of law. The expression for rule of law in Burmese is much better. It translates as the rule of just laws. So this is what we wish. We wish to live under the rule of just laws applied equally to everybody in the land. Unless we all feel that we have equal access to justice, that we have equal access to the protection of the law, we will not be able to sort out our differences. Quite often, when we talk to our ethnic nationalities about what it is that they are striving for, they say very simply, equality. They feel that the majority of Burmese are unequal, are unequally privileged. And I think they are right, because the Burmese are the majority. We are the strongest in numbers. We have been strongest in political power. And those in political power are in a position to do great wrong if they're not careful. And great wrong has been done to our ethnic nationalities. But I do not want the past to shackle us. I do not want us to be prisoners of the past. And I believe that our ethnic nationalities share this desire to break out of the prison of the past. For this, we have to learn to forgive. Not to forget. I do not think that forgetting helps because we must not forget where we went wrong in the past. In this way, we can go forward to a future where we all feel safe. Reconciliation and rule of law has been the foundation of my party, the National League for Democracy. When it was founded in 1988, we said we would work for democracy, for human rights, and for national reconciliation. Because these three are all linked. Without de democratic values, without the protection of human rights, and without national reconciliation, we could not become a strong and peaceful and stable nation. When we contested the by-elections last year, one of the major plan plans of our election platform was rule of law. Rule of law, an end to ethnic conflict, and amendments to the Constitution. Again, these are all linked, and these, of course, are linked to the basic principles of our party, democracy, human rights, and national reconciliation. We need rule of law in order that we make progress, not just politically and socially, but economically. There is great interest in Burma today as the golden hope for the future. This is the place where people hope there will be a happy ending, such as is rarely found these days in the world. But investment is not the answer to every problem of a nation. And even if investment is the answer, we will not be able to get the kind of 
economic investment that you wish for without the social and political security that those who invest would like to see. So, when we talk about rule of law, we are also talking about material progress, about the conditions that will enable material progress to take place in our country. And we need material progress as we proceed along the road to democracy, because our people have to feel that democracy is better for them. They, it must be demonstrated that democracy bears good and healthy fruit. So, a, a main element of the road to democracy that we must walk is the rule of law. Amendments to the Constitution are linked to this because the Constitution is the greatest and most fundamental law of the land. And unless it is just and seen to be just by our people, we will not be able to make them understand the importance of rule of law. The Constitution, as it is, is not acceptable to our ethnic nationalities. And so, apart from militating against the rule of law, it militates against national reconciliation. A constitution has to be acceptable to the vast majority of the people of the land. They should all have to feel that it is there to protect them and to make sure that they are the equal of everybody else on the land. I mentioned earlier the importance that our peoples put on equality. When we were campaigning for the by-elections last year, I found that the most effective way of making our people understand why they have a responsibility to vote was simply to explain to them that on that one day, the day of voting, they would be the equal of the president himself. He had one vote, each of them had one vote. And that they must use this vote and use it in a way which they think best. The sense that they were the equal of the highest in the land appealed to our people's sense of justice. And we had a turnout that I think was a record, about 70%. Can you claim that in Australia? I don't know. But I understand that in established democracies there is less, uh, less passion about election day. We are still passionate about election day because we are still at a point where, when we have yet to exercise the full rights of our citizenship. Reconciliation will help us to achieve our full rights because we will then be able to work together towards one goal. If we are divided, we will not succeed as early and as, and as painlessly as we might if we were to be united. That is why national reconciliation is essential to the cause in which my party and I have been engaged for nearly 30 years now. It astonished me sometimes to think that it is now 30 years since we started asking, calling, fighting for democracy. Then, I must admit, I did not think that the road will be quite so long. Hard, yes. We accepted that it would be a hard road. But we thought that the great majority of the people of our country understood the need for a political system that would keep us all together as a true union. But it is not so. There were many who believed that democracy was divisive because democracy meant too many different ideas, that too much independent thinking. This is one of the reasons why I say that I find sometimes that politics is very close to scholarship, that politicians are close to universities, because universities encourage free thinking, and we, as politicians who believe in democracy, encourage free thinking. When I was in Canberra, I visited 
the Australian National University and met some early students who were studying there. And I asked them what they had learned since coming to Australia. And one of them said to ask questions. That throughout his education in Burma, because he grew up under the military regime, he was never allowed to ask questions. And it was a surprise to him that questions not only could be asked, but should be asked, especially in an academic environment. I told him that the reason why he had learned only now that questions should be asked was because he had not joined our party. <laughs> <laughs> we, we were always encouraged to ask those questions. This is something that we had to do uh, religiously. Our young people, we had to say to our young people, you must ask questions. And then we had to teach our people to ask a very simple, practical question. At one point in time, this was in the 1990s, uh, things were very tough. Our people were arrested on the least pretext. And suddenly they would disappear from their homes because the arrests usually were made in the middle of the night. And then we would have to look for them. The families would have to look and inquire to find out where they were, in which interrogation centre, at which police station, at which prison. And we had to say to our people, now, if anybody comes to arrest you, you must ask them, do you have a warrant? <laughs> this is a simple question that we had to teach our people because we had been so far removed from the rule of law that we did not think that we had the right to question why we were being arrested. So we had to say, you must ask, have you got a warrant? And there's a story attached to it which is either funny or sad, depending on how you look at it. So one member of our party, who was a, a good learner, when the people came to arrest him in the middle of the night, he said, have you got a warrant? And the answer was, don't be silly, we all already have decided how long we're going to sentence you for. <laughs> so, that, that, that was, this was what his family told me after he'd been taken away in the night, that he had, he had listened to our instructions and asked this question and received an answer. So, you who live in a free society are unaware of the many everyday challenges that we have to face. When we talk about reconciliation and the rule of law, we are not talking about theses. We are not talking about theories. We are not talking about academic exercises. We are talking about everyday life. We are talking about the right to ask why our freedom was going to be taken away from us. And we are talking about the necessity for our people to be united that we may protect our freedom. A university is the best place in the world where young people can learn the importance of freedom and learn the importance of fighting to keep their freedom. Too often, people expect others to fight for them. It is, I have to confess, that it is in many ways touching but also, in many ways, it is a little discouraging when our people look to my party and me to do whatever is necessary for us to achieve democracy. Quite often, in the, in the more difficult days, I would have people coming to me and asking, and when are we going to get a democracy? In a rather accusing sort of way, as though we had not been doing enough. So, I would always um, retaliate with the question, what are you doing for us to, to help us achieve democracy? And uh, usually there would be no answer. But then I would say, if you are doing a lot to help us, then I think you can take it for granted that we'll achieve democracy soon. But if you're not doing anything, then you have no right to expect us to achieve democracy quickly for you. Everybody must make his or her own contribution. Democracy is not just rights, it's responsibilities. And this again is at the basis of national reconciliation. Everybody must have, think of their own responsibilities as well as rights. 
I think we all have a responsibility to try to work out our differences peacefully and wisely. In our country, there has been no tradition of negotiated compromise. I have said this often, and I have said this sadly, that we do not have a tradition of negotiated compromise. It's either win or lose. This comes from years spent under authoritarian rule, when the people were the losers and the rulers were the winners. It was never, there was never any question of who was on top and who was at the bottom. One of our member, one of our elderly members used to say that there were four castes in Burma. The top caste was the middle. Uh, the second were those who were uh, close to the military and who had acquired economic power. And the third in, in those days were the ceasefire groups who had come to an understanding with the military government. The fourth were the ordinary people. And he said, the NLD as a total outcast were low all of those because we had we enjoyed no rights whatsoever. We did not enjoy the rights of ordinary citizens. It was mentioned in the citation that uh, I was arrested in 2003 after the motorcade in which I was tra uh, traveling was attacked. We were the ones who were attacked and we were the ones who were imprisoned. Those who attacked us got away scot-free. We've never heard what happened to them. We've never heard whether or not any action was taken against them. We have never heard what was done to them. Not at all. But we, who lost some of our comrades, some of whom were uh, four died, not too many. I, I like to be accurate about these things because I, it's irresponsible to make a situation appear worse than it was. Four died. Many were wounded. And all of, almost all of us who were leading the Medicaid were imprisoned. What kind of rule of law is this? What kind of justice is it that punishment is inflicted on those who have been wronged? And how can we build a nation on the basis of such values? These are the, some of the reasons why we came to understand how important rule of law was. And that is why we have also held to the great need for national, re national reconciliation. Whatever we achieve in our country, we have to achieve together. Very often when I'm traveling abroad, I'm asked about why I do not condemn the army for what it is doing in the Christian state, or why I do not condemn Buddhists for attacking Muslims in the Rakhine state. I answer very simply, because I do not want to widen the divide already between the Kachins and the Obama's military, between the Muslims and the Buddhists in the Rakhine state. I have found that condemnation of one community increases fears and drives people to extremism. Everybody is afraid in a situation where violence breaks out all too often. I have said, and my party has stated officially, that the first step that has to be taken is to establish rule of law. That violence might stop. If people feel under threat, they cannot be expected to sit down to work out a solution to the differences. With regard to the kitchen state, the government is now conducting peace talks with the KIO, the Kachin Independence Organization. And I would like these peace talks to succeed. I would not wish to do anything that would jeopardize those talks. This is a time when we must give those who are involved in the peace negotiations to find success as best they can. By condemning one side or the other, we would only exacerbate, exacerbate the differences and encourage people to hold out for what they want without thinking of what they can give. National reconciliation has to be based on give and take, 
like a personal relationship. If one side takes too much, there will come a time when the other side will stop giving. But giving all the time is not the answer either. You also have to learn to take. Learn to take in the right way that the other side may understand that this is the basis of healthy relationship between human beings. This is the, relationship that is the basis of a healthy relationship between communities. As I read out at the beginning, there will never be an end to the process for rec of national reconciliation, as there will not be an end to the process of democratization. Democracy is a road. It's not uh, an absolute goal. In the same way, national reconciliation is a path. It's not an end. We have to walk the path of national reconciliation, supported by rule of law, that we may continue to strengthen the democratic roots of our society. The roots are not yet there. Now we think that the seedlings have been put in place. But seedlings can be swept away by a gust of wind. It can be, they can be kicked away by uh, an unheeding foot. Seedlings can be washed away by too much rain or dried up by very strong sun. So seedlings are not safe. We have to get to the point when these seedlings start to take root and the roots start to dig themselves into the ground. We have a long way to go before we get to that point. But we do want a chance to protect the <coughs> seedlings from dangers and devastation. This is why we put such emphasis on amendments to the Constitution, on the rule of law, and on national reconciliation. These are the defences against rough weather and against unkind, unkind actions against our very tender seedlings. The people of Australia enjoy the fruits of democracy. They are closer to both the East and the West than almost every other nation, and the peoples of every other nation, because there is no other country quite like Australia, which is, which was, perhaps I should say was, or should I say is, rooted in Western values and in Western traditions, and yet which is situated in the East, and increasingly more and more Eastern people are coming here and adding, enriching the diversity of your nation. Because you have these tremendous advantages, I would like you to look to countries like ours, who are just starting out on the road that you take for granted. You think that democracy is there for you, that you are entitled to democracy. But entitlement is a perception. There is no such thing as absolute entitlement. We have to be deserving. And I would like my people to start out knowing that they have to deserve what they want to get. But at the same time, I would like you who have already got much more than we will, we have, than some of us could even dream of achieving in our lifetime, that we need your help and we need your support. We need your informed support. Unless you know what our real needs are and what our real problems are, it will be difficult for you to give us the help that we need to proceed along the road that will truly make us part of this growing progressive world. Coming here to Australia, I, have, I am very privileged. Many of my peoples are settled here, but I am here as a visitor. I am privileged because I am a visitor, because I have not been obliged to give up my country for various reasons. Many of our peoples are here not because they want to leave their country, but because 
they were forced to by circumstances. As a visitor who has been welcomed very warmly, I would like to thank you for all that you have done for us in the past and also to ask you to keep with us as we travel into the future, as we work for reconciliation and the rule of law, that our nation may be free and secure and may be able to make its own contribution to the betterment of the world. So, as I thank you, I would like to request you to remain our true and good and informed friend. Thank you. Um, uh, and although we do enjoy such a 
great democracy, there isn't a lack of inequality uh, and struggle in our country as well. Um, for example, the indigenous population um, and also some migrant communities that have been uh, often unjustly um, treated and are still struggling with inequality today. So I was wondering if you have any thoughts on how we might be able to overcome our lack of passion, um, especially among the young people of Australia and how we can overcome perhaps what is an apathy um, towards the political system. Well, I think we should push out the house arrest for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> why I feel that the Australians can understand this. It's precisely because you have this problem with so the indigenous people, the rights, and then the fact that you recognize that the problems are there. That's a, a beginning. And I think if the young people start recognizing the fact that perhaps they're not as passionate about politics as they ought to be, then they will start changing. But if you live in a place like Burma, where, as I said, you don't even question why you're being arrested, you get passionate in a very short time. <laughs> but don't forget what you have. You must learn to value what you have. And come to visit us. And come to know some of the young people. And then you, the young people of Australia, who don't think that it's a great deal to vote. Uh, let me tell you, I've never once voted in a free election in my life. And now 68. Now, learn to, learn to value your privileges. I couldn't, I was, uh, before Burma became, uh, came under military rule, I was too young to vote. And by the time I was of, of age, there were no free elections. And then when there were, there were free elections in 1990, I was under house arrest. Uh, and then the last election, the uh, last by-election, when I did contest an election as a candidate, uh, my where I was registered, there was no vacancies, so there was no, there were no elections in my car, in the place where I was allowed to vote. So to this day, I have never once voted in a free election. So please, please value your right to vote and turn out to the next election and surprise your parents. <laughs> not like so much emphasis on Pangong because they were not signatories to it. 
So it's not just, it's not who signed it, but why this came about. Trust, you mentioned trust. It was mutual trust. It was not just the ethnic leaders trusting my father. He trusted them too. It was mutual trust. So you said, how can we build up national reconciliation? National reconciliation, it, it may seem very naive, it has to be built on honesty. Because without honesty, there can be no trust. I have often said to our party that we must never make easy promises to our people. We must not make the promises that we know we will not be able to keep. It is better that they should know that we have our weaknesses than to deceive them by pretending that we are totally strong. So, honesty is the way about it. When we talk about a second panel, we mean a meeting of the leaders of the different ethnic nationalities, including the Burmese, who are the major group, and working out a solution to their problems. But that can only be done if we trust one another. And let us, let us start by being honest with one another. We have tried to be honest. We, as I said earlier, we, uh, when, when I was asked to condemn the army or condemn the, the Buddhists or condemn the Muslims or condemn one side or the other, I always said no, because I do not believe that condemnation will keep bring us closer. And that, of course, made me rather unpopular, because people, when they are, people are asking for condemnation, they want condemnation. But we, I think we need to be honest. So I would like to say to all our ethnic nationalities, let us be honest with, with one another. Let us put our problems and fears and hopes frankly before each other, but at the same time respecting each other's sensitivities and aspirations. so much quicker than older people do. But at the same time, the wisdom and experience of older people is something that is irreplaceable. So we need people across the board, old and young, getting to know Burma at different levels, not just as organizations, but as individuals as well. I have great admiration for many people in Australia who have specialized uh, on, on academic subjects linked to Burma. I, I'm a, I think I must say this, I don't know whether this is allowed or not to praise somebody from another university. <laughs> but I have great admiration for Dr. Sean Tunnell, who has done marvellous work on the Burmese economy. And he has helped us tremendously by providing us with many good ideas on how we can promote a healthy economy. So I would like to be practical and to, as well as academic, thought and action must be linked to one another. And that way we will be able to help us think about what needs to be done and see if it can be done practically. Chancellor, that concludes the time. It's now my pleasure to call upon Professor of Medicine Paul Komisarov 
in his capacity as Director of Global Reconciliation to make a presentation. The Desmond Tutu Reconciliation Fellowship Award is named in honour of the most reverend Desmond Tutu, Anglican Archbishop Emeritus of Cape Town. It is the preeminent award for the recognition of accomplishments in the global field of reconciliation today. It provides a way of acknowledging and supporting people who have made outstanding contributions to dialogue and practical engagements aimed at enhancing understanding across cultural, racial, religious, political, and other divides. The Tutu Award is administered by Global Reconciliation, an international NGO based at Monash and RMIT universities. Global Reconciliation promotes communication and dialogue in communities in the midst of and following conflict, and presently is active in more than 40 countries around the world. Hong Song Su Chi is one of the most eminent advocates for peace and reconciliation in the world today. She is universally respected and beloved as a great and inspiring figure, and is seen as a symbol for the global struggle for human rights. Her political thought has been influential in many countries, especially in the developing world. Over more than two decades, she has remained at the forefront of the continuing battle for democratic freedoms in her country and has guided her people through a time of great pain and suffering. She has promoted reconciliation at all levels in Burma, including in relation to ethnic minorities and between the military regime and those who aspire towards democracy. She continues to draw on principles of restorative justice as well as the need for all voices to be heard. She has also contributed to international movements for peace, reconciliation and human rights. This includes her support for global reconciliation, of which she has been a patron since 2005. In relation to Australia, she and her organisation have facilitated a growing partnership of groups to support exchanges of many kinds with Burma in the fields of education, healthcare, law and culture and many, representations, many representatives of this partnership are here today. The Desmond Tutu Award is made on the basis of a nomination and review process which considers the past accomplishments and demonstrated ability for future achievement of candidates in any walk of life. The decision to offer this award to Hong Song Su Chi was made after consultation with a committee which included key representatives of the Burmese community in Australia and Australian supporters of democracy in Burma, including Professor Paul James, Dr Raymond Tintway, Mr Momong Tong, Dr Joseph Pereira, Saul Luin Ku, and Mr Chris Lamb. After considering her record of achievement, the committee was fully satisfied that Aung San Suu Kyi is unequivocally qualified to be a recipient of this prestigious award. The inscription chosen for the certificate reads, in recognition of outstanding work across communities in the struggle for greater understanding between cultures, civilizations, and political traditions, and in the healing of wounds created by social conflict. Do Hong Song Su Chi, it is my great honor to bestow on you the Desmond Tutu Fellowship.